something powerful about that that passage. I don't know if when you sing it or read it in the Lord's Prayer, when we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You could tell I learned that as a young child, CCD, uh, because I used the these and thous. But, <laughs> right, your kingdom come on. What, would, what, what could that mean when you think about that? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When I think of that, it's like, even though I'd never, most of my childhood, I never really understood what that meant. There was something beautiful about it. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Is, what, what, what is God's will being done in heaven that we want it to be done on earth? And then I think to, to unpack that properly, we have to really have an understanding of what heaven is. For so long, there's been this, uh, well, I don't, I think that there is a very human tendency for us to think in a very linear transaction justice based way, right? Where we think that it is right that when, when bad things happen, they should happen to bad people. And when people are good people, bad things shouldn't happen to them. And so we take that framework and we apply that to God and Christian theology, and we end up with this theology that says, okay, uh, I was a bad person, and then I, I, I accepted Jesus, and now I'm not a bad person anymore. Now bad things can't happen to me. And then we go, wait, bad things still happen to me, so it uh, well, must be because of sin, and maybe I sin, and so I need to repent. And when I repent and bad things happen to me, uh, there's something else wrong. And that's where we get a lot of people that just abandon faith, because that equation that they have doesn't seem to make sense. It doesn't fit in the experiential world because bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to good people. This is the conundrum that mankind has been wrestling with since the dawn of mankind. C.S. Lewis wrote a book about this called The Problem of Pain. And he says, this is the theological problem. If there's a good God, how can suffering exist? My hope in this series that we've been in, when we've been uncovering the promises of God, that, that you are able to, when you go in and you look at the text of Scripture and what God is trying to reveal to us through his progressive revelation of who God is over time, that you are able to go deeper into a new, more, more nuanced, more mature understanding of who God is and who are we as his people. We did a series, you could probably still find it online, about two years ago. Um, and it was about the mythical gods and the ideations of God that people believe in, like the superhero God uh, or the comfort blanket God, right? Um, but these are gods that we, we, we feel like we need and we conjure up that isn't the God that we're crying out when we say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What we're doing today is we're kind of we're we're, we're going to we're talking about this final promise of God where he promises a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. And for some of us it's like we got to weave through the old ideas that we had and 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 our di ideas that we had if you look back like the idea that I had that that um you know heaven is is like Hawaii <laughs> and and hell is like I don't know. For me, it's like central Washington. Like it's like always hot, always miserable. There's nothing around. There's no Starbucks nearby. There's no nothing, right? So, <laughs> but you, you get these ideations of physical, the physical comfort is heaven and physical suffering is hell. And then we take that concept and we, we try to apply it to eternity. And I'm just here to tell you, God in his infinite wisdom and in the word of God in the Bible says nothing of the sort. It's not here. But if you go to this and try to read this as if that's your non-negotiable framework, you're going to twist and contort scripture to try to make it seem that's the way. And for hundreds, if not thousands of years, 
Christian leaders have used that type of thing, church leaders, I should say, to, to manipulate people into, into responding to the gospel out of fear. Like, I'm, I'm going to turn to God because I don't want to burn in hell. And, and it's such an evil and manipulative thing when you look at when God is calling us to long for heaven, to long for God's will on heaven, to long for it here on earth. And when we long for God's will on earth, we desire the things of God. We, even if it means our own suffering. We long for the things of God. And what we're seeing here in, in Moses in Deuteronomy, we're in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. If you don't have a Bible, I want you to grab one or open one. So in Deuteronomy chapter 30, what we see is Moses is looking back at the last 40 years of him trying to lead people into the promised land. God has promised. He's delivered his people out of slavery and towards the promised land, and they've been wandering in the desert. Like a wandering that should have taken weeks has taken 40 years. And Moses is lamenting all the things that they did that kept them wandering. And he's saying, the things that keep you wandering and keep you suffering is also the things that would be called disobedience to God's way. The things that lead to the blessing and the fulfillment and the joy along the way is obedience to God's way. And he's warning the next generation. And he's pleading with them, as you go, you're going to suffer and you're going you're gonna to have blessings, but remain faithful to obedience to God. And if you, if you read if you read Deuteronomy 30 through the lens that I was talking about, that man-made lens of, of our linear view of justice, you, you, you'd be easy to read that as Moses saying, if you disobey God, God's going to react to your disobedience by punishing you with curses. If you obey God, God's going to react to your obedience by blessing you with blessings. That's not at all the context. Moses has a whole life of what we called flawed faithfulness. And he's sharing out of love to the next generation. These are the flaws. And I'm telling you, God has ordained his people to live in a certain way. And when we live in that way, there is blessing. It would also be easy to read into Deuteronomy that all the blessings that Moses is promising is earthly blessings. Because he says, you'll be blessed with children, with all your, your riches will be restored unto you. You'll have favor, you'll have, right? And so how many of us go through life equating God's love or God's presence with our physical blessings and our physical suffering? How many of you have gone through a difficult season in life and you wonder, what did I do wrong, O oh God? Or is this happening because I disobeyed? And there is some element of the promises of Deuteronomy that are true, right? Consequences of sin on earth are true. And, and I said last week, like sometimes we, we confuse the consequences of our bad decisions as some sort of righteous suffering. When no, they're just consequences and we can endure them and God is with us in those consequences right? Thou shalt not murder. If you murder, there should be consequences. <laughs> Don't murder, and you won't have those consequences. That's a blessing from the Lord. But when we do sin and there are consequences, eat those consequences are blessings from the Lord. Because if the desire of your heart is heaven, the perfect presence of God, you see even your own enduring as consequences as refining you to be there, to grow there, to become that. C.S. Lewis says that it is, a, it is a sure thing to tell someone whose heart is pure that they will see God because it is only the pure of heart who desire to see God. Now that should, like if when I reflect on that, that both inspires me and terrifies me. Because there are times where I long for the presence of God, but then I look back and I go, I don't, do I? 
do I really long for God's perfect will to be in this thing? Especially when I've been offended and I need justice. And I know that God's perfect will is that if someone repents and, they're for, and they, they receive God's forgiveness, they'll still have their consequences on earth, but they'll get God's forgiveness? Do I really want that? Do I really, am I willing to let myself go there? And that's just one example. But then I think even deeper and I go, well, maybe, maybe it's God's presence that's all I've been longing for. Maybe in my reflection on what I'm struggling with and, and when I sense there's something wrong or when I'm feeling guilt or shame, maybe that is me longing for God's perfect presence and his, his, his peace in those things. But we get so tripped up on looking at our present circumstances around, surrounding our physical world as whether or not God is present in our lives or whether or not we are experiencing his presence. And, and I hesitate to even say his blessing, because even the moment we say blessing, we conjure up our own desires as to what blessings are, when, when his presence is the ultimate blessing, and it's the thing that he promises the most. You guys remember that? 365 times there's a phrase in the Bible that says, fear not. And the, and the reason why he gives every time is a version of, for my presence is with you. Don't be afraid. The psalmist says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Where, where is he? The valley of the shadow. That's like depth upon depth of suffering. And God is with him. When we jump to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, if you look at Deuteronomy 30, where God, where Moses is telling the people, warning them, like, this is what the promised land is like. This is what it's like in the promised land. When you obey, it's good. When you disobey, it's bad. And he's clearly talking about earthly blessings. And then if you go to Ephesians chapter 1, which we're going to start getting into next week, you see Paul opens up Ephesians 1 with this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So right here, instead of, now here's a distinction, right? Moses is talking to the Israelites who are seeking the promised land, right? Now Paul is expanding this out to all Christians, all believers. So this is a more universal letter. But it's the same, very similar concept. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. There's a distinction here. So now all of a sudden, the promise coming to God's people isn't about having your riches and your land restored. Isn't about restoring blessings on earth. He's talking about heavenly realms and spiritual blessings. And then he goes on to tell you what those are. Verse four, the spiritual blessings are, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. It is a blessing for us to be holy and blameless in his sight. That is beyond an earthly blessing. That's a spiritual blessing. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. He, it is his pleasure to be restored to right relationship with us. We are loved and desired and pursued by this God. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. He has freely given us this grace. This is a spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. Here's the difference. The big thing, the big thing that's happened between Moses and the promised land and what Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus is Jesus. 
Jesus changed the nature of the covenant, the progressive revelation of this covenant between God and man. And now we know what it means for our hearts to long for the presence of God isn't material blessing. It's being assured and affirmed in our place as God's children in relationship with him that he has restored to us. So the central focal point of this transition from this blessing of the future promised land and then Paul reflecting on the blessings that have already happened, the thing that transpired is Jesus Christ. Jesus came to earth for the purpose of restoring those who are longing God for God's presence into a spiritual revelation, a spiritual new life, a spiritual new covenant. Whereas the promises of the old world are, if you, if you disobey God, it won't go well for you on earth. Now there's a spiritual covenant that says, this covenant is sealed on both ends by God. There is no condition upon this spiritual blessing. You are loved by God and it is secured It's the phrase that he used. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, which is Jesus. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished upon us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ Jesus to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth. In him, we're also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who are not the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise to his glory, to the praise of his glory. That phrase is repeated, to the praise of his glory. This is a testimony to God's glory that we have these heavenly blessings. They're secured. We're safe. That allows us to rest and have peace. And it allows us to look at obedience different. It allows us to look at obedience not Not that we will obey so we will get an earthly blessing, but we obey because we have received this eternal blessing. The motivation is different. The acts can be the same. The acts of obedience can be the same. But if we can let go of viewing the physical blessing, the earthly blessing of our obedience as the manifestation or as the, the hope, we'll say hope, of our obedience. And we can say the hope is already here and we live in a fallen world. How many of you have been in a place where you've done all the right things and it's gone terribly wrong? And the immediate natural reaction is, where's God? I did all the right things. I don't fault people for that question. but I ask you to reflect, why did you do the right things? Did you do the right things because you were hoping it would guarantee the outcome? Or did you do the right things because you're God's people and that means you do the right things? And when we suffer because of that, we join with Christ. We we carry the burden. We, we tell the truth to the world that there's something greater that drives us than striving after earthly blessings. And that is to the glory of God. Every time we can say, 
I live by the rules of the kingdom of heaven, not by the rules of earth. We testify. We testify to the power of God and we're set free. You're not defined by your struggles and your suffering. You're not defined by your failures. We are eternally set free. So when, we, when we're saying, hey, when you're posed with this, like it, it, Moses uh, is very clear in Deuteronomy. He says, I'm presenting you with, with two options. You can either choose life and obedience or disobedience and destruction. It's very clear. I'm even bringing in witnesses to testify what you're going to choose. We have that same choice. But our motivation isn't to achieve the blessing or avoid the curse. Our motivation is because we are transformed into God's people. And so when you make that declaration to say, I'm going to follow Jesus with my life. And some of you might be the first time you've ever, like today you are presented with this choice. Will you follow Jesus with your life? What does that mean? I'm going to live my life where because of what Jesus has done on the cross, and I believe that he resurrected from the grave, it gives me the power to overcome the temptations of this world, the longings of this world, the, the, the hollow blessings of this world. My motivation is greater. And when Moses goes to the next generation, he's pleading with them, his motivation is bigger than himself because he himself is told in the beginning of chapter 31, you are not going to go into the promised land. 120 years old, your whole life has been driving towards this. You're not going to get the blessing. And so he, being others-minded, being eternally minded, goes to the next generation and says, you're going to go it now. Please listen. This is the way it has to be. When we follow Jesus, we're prioritizing others. We're thinking in an eternal mindset where the next generation matters more than our comfort today. What decisions can we make today that will set up our next generation? I love the saying that it, it is the true hero that plants a tree whose sh under whose shade he will never sit. What are we doing? In your family, are you thinking, how am I going to save for my next vacation? Are you, are you thinking, how are my grandchildren going to be blessed? That's eternal mindset in a family. Are we thinking... What are, we, what are we balancing? Like, do you know someone who's suffering? Can you sacrifice something now just to ease someone's suffering for the moment? These are the ways where we see, where we do our part in fulfilling the prayer that we pray all the time. That thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if we are God's people, we are the ones through whom God's will becomes manifest. That's who we are. And so declaring to follow Jesus, being baptized into Jesus, is making that declaration saying, I will live my life that way. And it's a life of sacrifice. It's a life of eternal blessing. And there's no promise of a life of earthly blessing. But that's not why we do it. This is the example Jesus gave for us. And I don't know where all of you are in your faith, but if you have never made that decision to say, I'm going to follow Jesus with my life, you can make it today. You can make it this week. You can reach out to one of our staff. You can uh, do it by yourself. But we ask that you publicly declare it with us. We're going to have some baby dedications next month, and I'd love to have some baptisms. Okay, if you've never been baptized, if you ever made that conscious choice as an adult to say, I am going to follow Jesus with my life. You can do that here and we can celebrate it with you because you're not just baptized because of an idea. You're baptized into a community of believers who are committing to be in this journey with you on earth as it is in heaven. Let's do that today. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today and I thank you for your word and I thank you. I thank you that your word has been preserved in such a way that we get to see you in this. Thank you for all that you've done. And God, we give you praise and glory for calling us to this eternal mindset where we live for heavenly things, where we store up our treasures in heaven, not on earth. 
where we long for peace and reconciliation over comfort and achievement. God, let us be your agents of mercy and justice. Thank you for all that you've done in our lives, and I thank you for most of all for Jesus Christ. Thank you that he came to this earth in human form, lived among us, and conquered the very thing that separates us from living out this heavenly mindset, the, the shame, the fear, the doubt, the insecurity. Because the tomb is empty and he is resurrected from the grave, we have no reason to fear. We don't even fear death anymore. God, help us to live in the freedom. We've been liberated from the bondage of sin, of guilt, of shame, of regret. And you call us to live every morning like a new day. And we are a new creation when we trust in you, when we lean into you. Holy Spirit, move among us today in Jesus' name. Amen.